Welcome to this latest video on how to answer OCR GCSE computer science examination questions. In this video, I will be going through some of the sample questions that are available, but also talking through the thinking that sits behind being able to answer these questions. Uh, for this um, video, we're looking at system architecture. And in system architecture, we're looking at the physical components of a computer system, CPU, memory, uh, the components of a CPU, such as ALU, CU, registers, etc., and how they work together using the fetched code execute cycle to make your computer run. To start us off, we have a very straightforward question, which is a sort of fill in the gap type question, where Carrie wants to buy a new computer but she does not understand what the different parts of a computer do. Carrie has heard of a CPU, but does not know what it is. Before I kick this off, I'm just gonna do a really brief overview about what we're talking about here. Uh, what I've drawn here, and please don't be jealous of my drawing abilities, is I've drawn a laptop. I could have drawn a desktop, could have drawn, uh, truthfully, I could have drawn uh, any kind of computational device, such as a smartphone or even a smart TV. Uh, this, uh, is a piece of hardware, but of course inside here is something far more interesting that she makes the whole thing run. Inside this section of your laptop will be batteries and a bunch of other things, but in particular there'll be something called the motherboard. And here's my motherboard, not exactly drawn to scale. On your motherboard, you'll have a bunch of different components, like your CPU, like memory, and they'll be bussed around using wires on the motherboard. This is where it all connects. So we can imagine here there's a uh, CPU, uh, this, these are not drawn to scale, and these uh, things going out here, imagine they're sort of wires going out. Truthfully, there'll be a lot more wires than this, but this is just a simplistic version. We'll also have somewhere on the motherboard some form of memory. So imagine that bit there, that's RAM. And indeed, somewhere else, uh, connected off the motherboard, we'll have uh, an SSD or some kind of secondary storage. And these all have to sort of work together. So let's go over this again. This one here, this is your CPU, your central processing unit. The central processing unit fetches instructions, figures out what it's supposed to figures out what it's supposed to do by decoding them and then executing them. It's called the fetch decode execute cycle because essentially it's going to be continually cycling or cycling around processing these instructions. Not one instruction or two instructions a second, but billions of instructions every second. Where will it get these instructions from? Well, it could come from part of the CPU itself called cache, which is a type of memory, but also it could be coming from this section here called RAM. This is a type of memory that exists inside the CPU. Instructions could be um, kept here, fetched the CPU, decoded and executed, and then fetched. Again, it might also happen inside part of the CPU, and this is the bit that gets actually really quite complicated in the CPU, the sections of a CPU. So what do you have? Well, you have uh, cache. What is cache? Well, cache is your super fast memory, but it's very small. It can't store very many instructions, but it stores all the frequently used instructions. Every single time you can fetch from cache rather than fetching from memory, you've saved a bit of time. What happens inside it? Well, then it needs to decode it. To decode it, it uses another section or component of the CPU called the control unit. So this is the control unit. The control unit controls the fetch decode execute cycle, as in it manages it, manages the signal, synch synchronizes them, and also helps decode what the instruction is going to do. So we've Fetch the instruction, we've decoded the instruction, the last step is to execute. And execute in this mean is to sort of do it, to make it happen. And that happens in something called the arithmetic logic unit. The arithmetic logic unit does arithmetic uh, instructions, so does things like adding or subtracting. Logical, so comparisons, like is it the same as, is it larger than, those sort of things. And this can be shortened to A L. U. Control unit should be shortened to CU. So let's recap quickly what happens inside our little computer model. We also have a section of the CPU over here, sorry, a section of the hardware over here. Now this in this case will be a SSD, a solid state drive using flash technology, but what it represents effectively is something called secondary storage. Now 
Secondary storage has some properties that are different to RAM. This memory here is way faster than the memory on secondary storage. And cache is way faster still. So it's sort of like slowest, medium speed, fastest, if you want to imagine. However, cache has hardly any space. So maybe it's got, I don't know, eight megabytes worth of storage. RAM is maybe eight gigabytes of storage, so a thousand times larger. And your secondary storage could be in the terabytes, so it could be hundreds, if not thousands of times larger again. What other properties? Well, here's a deal with RAM. RAM is something known as volatile storage. That means as soon as you turn the power off, all the data disappears. Whereas uh, secondary storage is what's called non-volatile. So if you save your work to your secondary storage, then it will be saved there until the device uh, fails. So essentially it keeps it forever within reasonable parameters. With RAM, if you're saving it, if you've got your work in Word, for instance, and you haven't saved it, and somebody turns your computer off, the currently active data will be kept in RAM, and then RAM will be vanished, and then you've lost all your data. So what happens if you turn your computer on uh, for the first time? Well, what's going to happen? Well, uh, your SSD is going to hold all the instructions and all the data for operating system, for instance. But something needs to kick this all into life. Now, your CPU doesn't know where to fetch from. It doesn't know what to fetch from here or to fetch from here. What can it fetch from RAM where it's expecting to it? Well, because it's volatile, RAM will hold no information when it's turned on for the first time because it's volatile. So you need a third type of memory here called ROM. Now, ROM stands for read-only memory. And in this case, it's going to hold your BIOS. That's your basic input-output system. This is really primitive instructions just to kick your computer into life. If you've ever turned on your computer and wondered why there's this really look, thing that looks like it's from the 1970s with this sort of black background and white text, well, that's because this is the chip that's making that happen. This is uh, got your first instructions. And of course, it's non-volatile. So no matter if you have turned it off for a long time or whatever, it can always boot from here. This is sort of like where you can, this is where your uh, kickstart will come from, your bootstrap for your whole system. And it will tell your CPU things like, okay, where on secondary storage do I find the operating system? What settings do I have for the RAM? As in what speed do I set it at? What about the settings for the CPU? All these bits. So that will start your boot up instructions. Then it will uh, fetch, it will say, okay, operating system exists here. Now, it won't fetch instructions directly from secondary storage because as we've said, secondary storage is really slow. You might have wondered, what does it mean when it says loading, loading operating system, loading computer game? Well, loading means it's moving data from secondary storage into RAM. So it's copying the data into here. And then once it's copied over, then it will fetch the code and execute here. It will fetch the instruction. Um, and if the frequently used ones will be kept in cache, it will decode it in the control unit, execute it in the arithmetic logic unit. And then this will keep um, turning around, going to its cycle millions, if not billions of times every single second. So that is your overview about how all this works. Let's come back to our question. The CPU stands for, so the first one was central processing unit. It is the part of the computer that fetches and executes the, so do you remember what you had to fetch? Begins with I, that's right, it's instructions. So they're fetched and executes the instructions, which are all the small commands the computer needs to do. Next we have what they are stored in. So remember where they were stored, they'd either be stored in cache or in main memory, in RAM, or in secondary storage. But all of those together come under the description of memory. So they're all stored in memory. Now we're looking at components of the CPU. So the CPU contains the arithmetic something unit. And they've tried to help you out by calling it the ALU. Remember the arithmetic logic unit. And what was the other component? This was the bit that helped you decode instructions, the CU, the control unit. OK, uh, I'm not going to do a big recap like I did on the last slide, uh, because I think we know a lot of information to answer this. Here are some statements about the CPU of a computer. Take one box in each row to show whether each of the following statements is true or false. 
Okay, so we just need to evaluate each of these. The CPU stands for the central processing unit. Well, we've just established that. That is true. The CPU fetches and decodes instructions. Well, we just established that as well. And it also executes, but it's not there, so that's true. The speed of a CPU is usually measured in gigahertz. So this comes down to the frequency of the CPU. Hertz or one hertz is something that happens once per second. A gigahertz is billions of times a second. And modern CPUs are nearly always rated in gigahertz, so billions of times a second. If a CPU has many cores, this slows down the computer. Not true. The more logical cores it has, uh, and the more physical cores it has, the faster it can process. So that's false. And then finally, the hard disk drive is part of the CPU. If you remember back to our model, our SSD, or our secondary storage, is outside the CPU. So it's not part of the CPU. False. So let's look at this question here. Identify four events that take place during the fetch execute cycle. And truthfully, we should think that as the fetch decode execute cycle. So that is a cycle with three main sections. In the first instance, data is first fetched. So it's fetched from somewhere. Now, fetched, we mean it in our everyday life as in to go gather, to go grab something. So where do you fetch from? Well, you fetch from uh, memory. So that could be RAM or that could be uh, cache, but that's where you need to fetch from. So we're fetching from memory, but it's worth thinking, what are we fetching? Well, in this case, we're fetching instructions. So instructions are going to be these small uh, individual instructions like to add or to subtract, but because we're doing billions of them a second, it means that we have tremendous power. So the first stage of the fetch execute cycle is to fetch. The next thing is, can you remember? That's right, the next one is to decode, to figure out what you're supposed to do with it. The CU decodes. Do you remember what the CU was? That's right, it's the control unit. And why does it need to decode it? Well, the instructions are in a bunch of ones and zeros. It needs to figure out, are these ones and zeros to add? Are they to subtract? Is this an address in memory I need to get hold of? Is it actual value? That's what the decoding does. And then the final stage, what's the final stage? That's right, the final stage is to execute the instruction. Now that we've figured out what the instruction is supposed to do, we execute the instruction by sending it to the arithmetic logic unit ready to be calculated. What happens next? Well, this cycle will repeat and it will keep repeating. Uh, what else do we need to learn about? Well, something we haven't spoken about are, or, are something called registers. So how does this happen? What registers? So these are small parts of the CPU, components a bit like the control unit and arithmetic logic unit, and the registers are small bits of memory that help support, make this thing work, make the actual um, fetch the code execute uh, cycle happen. And so we need to learn about a couple of those. Now we said that uh, instructions were fetched from memory. So this is an example of how you can imagine memory, just whether it's RAM or cache, banks of um, spaces where you can keep instructions. And you see they're numbered, because you need to know where do I fetch the next one from. Now uh, under standard conditions, all instructions for a particular process are all one after each other. So once you fetch one instruction, uh, instruction from position one and decode and execute, then you need to get two, then three, then four. And something needs to keep track of that. Now that's the first of the registers we'll talk about. It's called the program counter. Okay, so these are the three registers we need to learn about. The program counter, the memory address register, and the memory data register. And all of them are about keeping track of which bit of um, a memory we're using, as in the address of it, and also what was actually held in there. So for instance, let's say in this first instruction we had 011101. Do I know what that's meant to do? I have no idea whatsoever. But do you see what address it's at? It's at number one. So program counter starts looking at number one because address one. It then passes it, this value would then be pushed down to the memory address register. And that would then contain the value one. That would tell the CPU that it needs to fetch from address one. So one is fetched and then dropped into the memory data register. 
Now, that's going to hold the data of what's held in here. And you see my box is just nowhere near sufficiently large enough. So let me just fix there for a second, because what I'm going to need to do, right, is I'm going to need to make it large enough to be able to hold that entire bit of data. So there we go. Ooh, is that going to be large enough? Maybe if I make it a bit smaller for a second. One second. Was it 0, 1, 1, 0, 1? OK, so 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. There we go. So that's now holding the data at that place, ready for it to be executed. Then uh, fetched. What happens is then the program counter, every single time that the cycle goes around, it's the thing that's keeping track of what the current address we're going to be fetching the instruction from is. So instead of 1, it increments, and it goes up by 1. So this time it will be 2. And then 2 will be passed into the memory address register. You fetch the instruction from 2. It gets put into the memory data register. It decodes it. And onwards and onwards in an endless cycle this goes. All right, guys, let's see if we can then answer the question. So let's start with the basics. Let's just, thought, let's just talk our way through the fetch to code execute cycle. The first part is that it fetches. So an instruction is fetch from memory. Then you need to think what the next stage is. So the next stage is that it decodes it. So it then decodes the instruction at the control unit. And then last do the last section of the fetch to code execute cycle, which is to execute. And so the instruction is then executed at the arithmetic logic unit. Uh, this is the place where you can get into a bit of danger because you think, aha, I've, I've answered it completely. But you can see you've got, you'll have one mark for saying it's fetched, one mark for saying it's been decoded at the control unit, and then the last mark here for being at the ALU. But that's three marks. What else can we say? Hey, the first thing is, it's a cycle. So you talk about the fact that the process um, will then repeat. We also can be talking about, and I know we're at four marks now, but it's worth knowing, because I'm sure we'll need it later on, how the register use. So what does the program counter do? The program counter uh, increments at each cycle. Uh, sometimes the program counter is referred to as the PC, because it's the shortened version. The memory address register, guess what that can be referred to as? The MAR. What does the MAR do? MAR uh, indicates what? The address of the next instruction. And I've run out of space here. But what we can say is for the MDR, the MDR holds the contents held in the memory location indicated by memory address register. So the memory address register holds the actual address, but then the contents, what's held inside it, is held in the memory data register. OK, so this sets up us quite nicely for this question here, where we have a bunch of statements we need to evaluate and then say, which one of these does it apply to? And note, one or more boxes. So we have to go and compare each one as we go along. So in this case, it stores a single address. So let's go through each one. The memory uh, address register holds the address of the instruction we want to fetch. So that's definitely a single address. Memory data register, well, that holds the contents. So that's not going to be holding an address. It holds the contents. Cache, that cache will hold a bunch of uh, instructions, frequently used instructions. So it won't be a single address program counter that does hold the address and then it increments as you go through each cycle and ram ram holds lots of information uh, instructions and data so definitely not a, sing uh, a single one it stores frequently used instructions ah this is nice because uh, mar doesn't store any instructions it stores the address mdr doesn't store one instruction but it's whatever the current fetch to code execute one is so uh, that doesn't apply. Cache, that's what stores frequently used instructions. Program counter address, RAM. RAM's going to store all the instructions and data you currently need, not necessarily most frequently used ones. It is a register. So which one of these? In fact, we can say cache is not a register, although it's a component of the CPU, it's not a register, and RAM is not a register. It might be worth pointing out what additional registers we have we also have the accumulator that keeps track of the running total, uh, as opposed to the, uh, in addition to these three. And then finally, it stores all currently running data and instructions. 
Well, the MAR definitely not because it's only storing a single address. MDR is only holding the current instruction values. Cache, that is going the most frequent, not all of the currently running, just the most frequent. Program counter is a single address. And then it's RAM. Yes, RAM is holding all the currently running. Now, there'll be other data and instructions for applications that you're not currently running. Let's say in the background right now, you're not running PowerPoint, but that will be held on secondary storage. All currently running ones are in RAM or indeed in virtual memory. Okay, identify and name one of the registers not given and describe its purpose. So we can't say MAR, MDR, or program counter because they've all been provided for. So we need an additional one, and I mentioned it previously, the accumulator. The accumulator is actually inside the arithmetic logic unit or forms a component of it. And what it does is that, let's say you've added two numbers together, it holds the result of that uh, arithmetic operation. So holds the result or stores the result of arithmetic operations and keeps sort of adding up. It's a bit like on a calculator, you know, when you do a sum and it gives you the output, the, out, the actual running total, that's like, kind of like an accumulator. And say that it stores the results of the arithmetic logic unit. Okay, let's read this question. Uh, Alicia has designed a computer using the von Neumann architecture. Remember, the von Neumann is when data and addresses, sorry, data and instructions are held in the same memory and they're all fetched one after each other. Uh, describe the purpose of two registers that are used in the von Neumann architecture. So we can think about the four registers we've learned about the program counter, uh, the PC, the memory address register, the MAR the memory data register, the, mem uh, the MDR, and finally the accumulator, sometimes uh, shortened to the AC. Okay, and we can think about uh, picking two of those examples and how we describe it. Sometimes the program counter and memory address register can get a bit confusing for people. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to do the two of them, but I think maybe we could do program counter maybe, and let's say, uh, and let's say the MDR, since we've been talking about those quite a bit. So the program counter could be one, so you get a mark for that straight away. Uh, so the program counter has two jobs, really. It stores the address of the next instruction to be fetched. So not the instruction, but the address of the instruction and increments. So stores the address of the next instruction to be fetched and increments uh, at each cycle. And it's a bit similar because, of course, then the program counter passes the value of the address down to the MAR, and then that stores the address where data will be read uh, or written to next. So it's quite similar. So I can see how people could trip up on it. So I'm going to go switch to the MDR, the memory data register, and that holds the content. So it stores the, uh, the actual uh, instruction from the address that's been taken from the MAR. So the MDR stores the data instruction slash instruction that is fetched read from my memory because it could be data that you're holding or it could be the actual instruction that it could be. It's difficult to say. And then it's fetched and read from main memory. Right, a question like this is all about CPU performance and why one CPU performs better potentially than the other and what factors they could be. So Anne wants to purchase a new computer and is looking at two models. The specification of the CPU is shown below. So we're looking at clock speed, cache size, and number of cores. And so we have to evaluate one why one may be better than another. Let's explore each of these individually. So first of all, clock speed, one gigahertz versus 1.4 gigahertz. Now, a gigahertz is something that happens once per second. So we can imagine that we've got a CPU here doing a fetch, decode, and execute cycle. And if it's at one hertz, maybe it's stepping forward once per second. If it's going at 10 hertz, then it'll be going 10 times a second. So you can see the faster the clock speed, the more rapid or the more frequent you can have fetch to code execute cycles and therefore will have better performance. A gigahertz, so you remember giga comes from a billion, so one gigahertz is happening one billion times a second. 1.4 gigahertz, 1.4 billion times a second. Which one's faster? Well, we can say that 1.4 will be faster. Cache size, now if you remember, the question is, is when you're fetching, could you be fetching from either RAM or could you be fetching from, let's say, cache here? If it's cache, uh, and I'm going to highlight that by saying it's in, I don't know, it's in yellow. Cache is yellow here, right? 
you see when it's fetching it, it's literally fetching it from part of the CPU, so it's way faster. If it's in RAM, it's going to have to go over a bus over the motherboard, get to the RAM and fetch it back, so it'll be a lot slower. The more cache you have, the more frequently used instructions you can hold, and therefore you have more performance. Finally, the number of cores. Uh, well, uh, on these computers, you could have a CPU that actually has effectively two uh, logical cores or even physical cores, and they are doing their own fetch to code execute cycle. If you have dual core, you've got two of them working together. That's going to give you a lovely big advantage, and if it's quad core, even more of an advantage. So let's apply that logic to here. When running a 3D fight simulator, computer one is likely to run faster than computer two. All right. So although it's got slower clock speed, so one gigahertz, you can do a, this really rough calculation where you can say actually it's one gigahertz, but it's times by four cores, right? So times by uh, four. And that could give you this kind of really rough, it's not quite as simple as this, but it gives you a rough 4 gigahertz calculation, while the other one is doing 1.4 gigahertz. So each core is actually faster, but there's only two cores. So in this case, it's 2.8 gigahertz. Now, it's actually not super straightforward because it depends how well optimized the code is to run on multiple cores. But a 3D flight simulator maybe is written that way, and therefore its advantage is that it has more cores. And then in our final question, explain one reason why the cache size affects the performance of the CPU. So we have to say, well, if you weren't fetching it from cache, where would you fetch it from? You fetch it from RAM. So we need to say, first of all, that cache has higher performance than RAM. Therefore, if you every time you can fetch an instruction from cache, you've picked up a little bit of speed. Now, it doesn't say it here, but of course, why would it be more? The question could be then, why is it more advantageous to have more cache? Well, that's quite straightforward. If you have more cache, more frequently used instructions, more times where you can fetch from the cache as opposed from the RAM, therefore you'll gain more speed. Fantastic. This is another question that will be about CPU performance and the four factors of uh, clock speed, number of cores, cache size, and potentially even the type of cache. In this question here, we're looking at uh, uh, Quinn's current computer, so they're given the specification there, and then describes the benefit of a dual core over a single core processor. So I think for a question like this, why don't we start off by saying what is a dual core versus a single core? That'd be a good start. And then we can say that it's double, it's going to be obviously then double a single core. This means that at the same time, instructions can be fetched, decoded, and executed on these two different, on these two different uh, cores. This is called parallel processing. So we can say parallel processing can take place. And then as, we, as I've kind of just mentioned, we have to do this very carefully. What do we mean by parallel processing? Which means that instructions can uh, be processed at the same time or executed at the same time. The at the same time code is very important. Parallel processing can take place, meaning that different instructions, so you can't have, uh, can be executed at the same time. You can't have the same instruction being read by two different things at the same time, that wouldn't work. But separate instructions can be run at the same time uh, for parallel processing. The CPU has a clock speed of 3.8 gigahertz. As we referred to earlier, a hertz is once per second, a giga a billion times per second, so this will be 3.8 billion times a second. Describe what is meant by clock speed of 3.8 gigahertz per second. So first of all, let's say uh, big, the big picture is it's the number of FDE, fetch to code execute cycles, that can run per second. And then in this case, we'll say how many that is. So in this case, it's 3.8 billion cycles per second. A continuation is that Alicia says, quote, my computer has a quad core processor. If you remember, that's four processor cores. So it will run twice as fast as a computer with a dual core processor. Now, explain why this statement's not always true. And remember, we then have to think about the other factors that influence performance. So if it had the same clock speed and the same amount of cache, then yes, if you had uh, a quad core, it would be twice as fast as a dual core. 
even then it's assuming that the code is written so it can take advantage of that well. So we want to talk about uh, these different factors of clock speed and of cache. So we can say that the computer processor may have different clock speeds. So if, if the quad core was going at one gigahertz and the dual core was going at five gigahertz, then you'll see a significant difference in speed and it wouldn't be comparable. And indeed the cache size. Uh, we also need to consider how the software has been written. If software hasn't been written to run on multiple cores, you won't get much of an advantage. It's also worth knowing that some types of applications that require lots of branching, so lots of if statements, you can't really use multiple calls very well because of course you don't know which one is going to happen whether the if or else is going to trigger so you can also say some tasks cannot be split across calls brilliant let's move on to the next we're now moving on to the topic of embedded systems so these aren't general purpose computing devices like laptops or smartphones or desktops etc these are ones that are built for one specific function not multiple functions so these will be things like microwaves washing machines single purpose single function devices computing devices that are much more basic more straightforward you can't install apps on them they only boot from rom so let's look at this question here the following paragraph describes embedded systems Complete the paragraph by selecting terms from the list and writing them in the correct places. Not all terms are used. So we've got a bunch of different questions here. Embedded systems have limited something. So what they've limited? Hopefully you picked up from what I was just saying. They have limited functions. Typically they have one function that they're trying to achieve as opposed to a general purpose device that will have multiple functions depending on what application you install. All right, let's move on. They are often built into a, so they could be into a washing machine, dishwasher, fridge, car. They're often built into a larger machine, a larger machine. In fact, we're going to see more and more of these embedded devices. In fact, we have much more embedded devices than we have general purpose. Two examples of embedded systems are, so if we look through this list, one of the ones I can see here is a washing machine. So that's an example. And then something in a car. So we're going to look through here. What one of these could be inside a car? Automated, aha, automated lights. So that there's some system in there that's detecting the level of light at the time. And if it drops below a certain level, the lights come on automatically. Gareth Satnav contains an embedded system. Define what is meant by an embedded system. Uh, these are one of these definitions that you're just going to have to make sure you've learned. But essentially, it's a computer system that's built into another device. So like we say, a washing machine, uh, the uh, light system, the automatic light system for a car, etc. So a computer system that's built into another device. And now we've been asked to identify three devices other than a sat-nav that contain embedded systems. So my go-to is always a dishwasher, but there's loads of examples here. Just be careful with some of them. So they might accept something like a mobile phone, but it wouldn't be a smartphone because smartphones are a general purpose device. So you're thinking about devices that have a single purpose. So dishwasher, washing machine, uh, uh, microwave, uh, these sort of devices I would go for. So, I, and I would be really careful about, say, TV or mobile phone, because, of course, if it's a smartphone, you can install applications going to have multiple functions. And, of course, a TV could be a smart TV. So I'd be really careful about using those kind of definitions. So, yeah, dishwasher, washing machine, microwave, I think you're all fairly safe. Depeche is thinking of buying a tablet computer to replace his old desktop computer. Now, from our point of view, both of these are conventional computing devices um, following von Neumann architecture. So actually, fundamentally, although one may be faster because it's got a better clock speed or maybe faster secondary storage, fundamentally, they are the same type of device. Describe how the CPU and RAM work together to enable the tablet computer to operate. Right, okay, so what is it that the CPU needs to do? It does the fetch to code execute cycle. What is it fetching? Well, it's fetching instructions. Why are those instructions actually held? They're held in RAM. 
So that's the connection. Once you've done your calculation and you've executed your instruction, ultimately, where could that data go back to? It probably will go back to the RAM. So RAM and uh, the CPU work hand in hand together. Let's start by talking about what the RAM is going to do. So the RAM is going to hold uh, instructions and data uh, of the currently running programs. What happens next? Well, the next thing is that the CPU has to fetch uh, from RAM. When fetched, it has to do one last thing, which is then if it actually executes and updates it, it then has to write these instructions back to the uh, RAM. So the results from executing instructions are written back to RAM. So you can see there's this sort of dance backwards and forwards between the two different devices. Finally, we have a question on cache memory and what's the purpose of it. We remember cache is super fast memory that allows it to store frequently used um, instructions. Uh, because it's faster than RAM, it will want to store the most frequently used instructions because every time you can fetch from there, you speed up the access. We're now looking at system architecture, but looking at memory. And if you remember, memory could include things like cache and RAM, secondary storage. But we also talked about the difference between something called RAM and something called ROM, and the different, uh, the different needs there are for both technologies. If you remember, with RAM, we said it was volatile, while with ROM, we said it was non-volatile. If you remember, volatile meant that if the power went off, it lost all its data, which is why if you're working on Word and somebody turns your computer off, you lose all that data because it's holding all the currently running programs. As soon as you turn it off, you lose it. Whereas ROM is non-volatile. If you want to boot up a computer from being off to on, one of the things that you're going to need is that you're going to need to have uh, a little bit of memory that is non-volatile so it can actually keep those boot up instructions. So that's why ROM is needed. So difference number one between RAM and ROM is that RAM is volatile while ROM is non-volatile. The second thing we need to consider is what do we use RAM and ROM for? Now RAM is used to hold currently running programs, data and operating system, whereas Whereas ROM is used to keep boot up instructions. So RAM is used to hold currently running programs, data, and the operating system, whereas ROM is used for boot up instructions. So RAM stores currently running programs, data, and the operating system, while ROM stores boot up instructions. It's also worth thinking, and this could have been a third option, a third difference, is that ROM is read only memory. While with RAM, you can both read and write from it, i.e. ROM can't be changed. Quinn has decided to upgrade the RAM on his computer. Explain why this would improve the computer's performance. Over here, I've actually got a little diagram of RAM. And this is, my, uh, this is how you can imagine RAM is. This is this sort of space where you can store your currently running programs and operating system. And this is 1 gigabytes and 2 gigabytes and 3 gigabytes and 4 gigabytes of RAM. Now let's say at the beginning you start loading your operating system. So the operating system starts loading in and I'm going to shade that in with green and it's taking two gigabytes. So all this here, that's taking two gigabytes worth of data straight away, leaving me with only two gigabytes to run my other applications. I then want to run Chrome and for argument's sake I'm saying that takes one gig of data. So now I've got three gigs left. And now what I want to do is I want to be able to run um, I want to run Sims 4 for some reason, and let's say it needs 2 gigs of data. And you see here, there's not enough space to be able to run 2 gigs worth of data. Do you remember what happens if you don't have enough space, what you actually do about that? That's right, what you do is you have a place called virtual memory. This is when you've taken a section of your secondary storage and then you've turned it into virtual memory. Now, obviously, it's still really slow because it's still a secondary storage. But what we can do is we can offload tasks we're not currently using. So let's say that's Chrome. And we put that over here. When we're shifting it, we're transferring it to virtual memory. Now, that means that then in RAM, we don't need this bit anymore. We can get rid of all of the bit that was to do with Chrome. Sorry if that was a bit ugly uh, fix for it here. And I wanted to load Sims 4. Sims 4, let's say, is requiring 2 gigs, uh, and now I've got enough space to actually load it in. At some later points, 
uh, oh yeah, this bit on the right is virtual memory. I should do that. At some later point, let's say I want to, uh, oh, I don't know how I want to load a Netflix app. There's no space. So what I might have to do is move Sims 4 over here to free up space. Now, what is the advantages of having more RAM? Well, the more RAM you have, the more currently running programs you can have in RAM. And of course, that means you don't have to use virtual memory as much. Virtual memory is a big problem, especially if you're constantly moving things backwards and, and forwards, because virtual memory is very slow. Eventually, if you're using virtual memory too much, your entire program, your entire computer, is running at the speed of your secondary storage. And if you're using, say, magnetic hard drive for your secondary storage, that might really, I mean, that will really slow your system down. So the first point I'm going to want to make is that more programs or applications can be run at the same can be held in RAM at the same time. If you didn't have more RAM, what would happen? So uh, what happens if we use virtual memory? It's going to really slow it down. So if we have more RAM, we don't have to use it as much. So we reduce the use of virtual memory. Why is that good? Well, because then that will uh, increase the speed because if there's less use of it, it will increase uh, the speed of the, of the device. Anything else we could say? Well, of course, there might be, uh, you know, let's say in our example here, if we need an app that required five or six gigs, we couldn't run it because even with virtual memory, we don't have enough space. So it's going to allow you to run uh, software that requires more memory. So if we went up to eight gigs, suddenly you'd be able to actually store a six gig bit of uh, RAM of um, application. So this is now using, looking at an application of RAM and ROM. A satellite navigation system uses RAM and ROM. So imagine this is in the car potentially or something. Tick one box in each row to show whether each of the statements is true for the ROM or RAM. So we have to evaluate each of these. Stores the boot up sequence of the sat nav. Now as we discussed, the boot up is always going to be held on ROM. Uh, because RAM, as soon as it boots up, will be empty because it's volatile. The contents are lost when the sat-nav is turned off. There we go. So ROM is non-volatile, which means it will keep all that data, while RAM is volatile. Therefore, as soon as you turn it off, all data will be lost. That means if you wanted to hold details like, for instance, roots, you'd need some kind of secondary storage, like maybe an SD card, to store that. Uh, what we got here? So uh, holds copies of open maps and routes. So this is stuff that will be currently open and currently running that will all be in RAM. We're now looking at secondary storage. So this isn't RAM or cache or ROM that can be primarily accessed for the CPU. This is stuff that's accessed indirectly but gives us ability to have long-term storage. If you remember ROM is non-volatile so it can be kept forever but you can't write to it. RAM, you can read and write to it, but it's volatile, which means as soon as you turn it off, data is lost. We need somewhere that's non-volatile and can keep it and could be read to and written from. That's where secondary storage comes in. So Nina wants to transfer photos from a digital camera to an external secondary storage device. Define what is meant by secondary storage. So this is a straightforward definition. So I'm saying it's long-term. Why is it long-term? Because it's non-volatile i.e. even when the power goes off it keeps it storage of data. Underneath here well, then we talk about what the different types of secondary storage. So you might have heard things like magnetic hard drive and solid state hard drives and flash drives, USB drives, Blu-rays. Well there are actually only three main categories. The first of those categories we're going to discuss is something called optical. Optical, i.e. meaning light, means that this could be CD, DVD, or Blu-ray. Fundamentally using similar kinds of technology, just it, it's how much uh, basically pits and flats you can have on a piece of data and whether it's using light, infrared light or uh, laser. Uh, so that's optical. Uh, the next one we think about is magnetic. For the most part that involves essentially magnetic, conventional magnetic hard drives. And these are really good because you can store huge amounts of data fairly cheaply. There are actually other things like called backup uh, magnetic drives where you can put tape onto it. Uh, there's floppy disks, although I must say these days you very rarely see this type of technology. Uh, the final type of technology is solid state, otherwise known as flash storage. 
that's when you're using circuits to store data and is a huge growth in this area mainly because you can actually have very relatively small um, um, physical sized storage so you can have SD cards micro SD cards which are absolutely tiny storing hundreds of gigab uh, gigabytes so you'll find in your phones it will exclusively be using flash storage as a secondary storage modern laptops generally use it but for a desktop maybe it's less of a uh, of concern in terms of its size however what it can offer is a lot of speed and so when we're thinking about these we need to think about different properties so what are some of the properties well we just mentioned one which was uh, the um, which is the uh, portability so by portability what do we mean well you consider magnetic not so portable because it's got moving parts in it it's big and bulky while solid state since it doesn't have any moving parts is really portable to move around other really important ones were like uh, capacity uh, or size i.e. how much you can actually store in it and typically that means magnetic is generally king of this solid states are behind it and optical is nowhere near the size for an individual one but of course you could have like 100 blu-rays storing a lot of data then you can talk about things such as speed and again we're looking through these uh, generally solid states near the top magnetic next and then finally optical this is the reason why if you have a PlayStation 4 or 5 or an Xbox uh, the first thing you do when you get a disc is that it will try installing it to the hard drive rather than reading it off the optical speed well speed wise generally solid states the fastest but of course if it's just a regular SD card it's probably slower than magnetic and then maybe another important one to consider would be cost so this is generally referred to cost per gigabyte where the solid state is the most expensive, the magnetic and optical generally the cheapest. What else can we think about? There's durability, there's reliability, these are all different factors we could think about.